All right, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to this, uh, this WebEx version of our Distinguished Lecture Series for 2020. My name's Jeff McDonald. I'm a professor here at the School of Environment and Sustainability and the Associate Director at the Global Institute for Water Security. Uh, this seminar series is uh, supported and underwritten by the Global Institute for Water Security, uh, directed by Jay Famiglietti, and also Global Water Futures, which this is a part of, led by John Pomeroy. So we thank Jay and John for their support. Before we get going, I just want to acknowledge that uh, here in Saskatoon, we're on Treaty 6 uh, territory that we acknowledge, homeland of the Métis, and we, through this uh, seminar series, are paying our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirming our relationship with one another. And before we get going, I want to uh, just make a plug for next week where we have Anna Barros uh, speaking from Duke University and watch your emails for alerts on that. But today, we are very lucky to have with us uh, Ilya van Meerveld from University of Zurich. Uh, Ilya has a, a rich background in hill slope hydrology, and I think today is one of the, the very leading hill slope hydrologist catchment process hydrologists. Certainly, her work is the work I'm uh, most reading, I think, of all my colleagues these days. And you'll, you'll see some of the reasons why as we go through the lecture today. Ilya obtained her PhD at Oregon State University in 2004. She then went to EPFL in Lausanne to do a postdoc uh, in the fluid dynamics group of Mark Parlange. From there, she came to Canada and taught at Simon Fraser University, I think for about six years, and then was lured back to Europe, uh, first at the Free University in Amsterdam, and then to her home now at the University of, of Zurich, where she works. Uh, Ilya is leading some very large uh, international efforts in hill slope and catchment hydrology. You may hear about some of that uh, this, this week with her uh, uh, excavations of different age landscapes in Switzerland, uh, complete with uh, videos and, and uh, lots of multimedia. She's working on a, a crowd water campaign that is, has a lot of uh, awareness and growing excitement. You might hear about that as well. Uh, Ilya has many accolades. She's currently editor of Water Resources Research and uh, really is uh, someone I, I deeply respect in terms of her science and contributions to our field. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Ilya and thank you, Ilya, for participating late evening, your time. Thanks, Jeff. Um, well, hard to start now, but um, I will indeed say something about um, the crowd water parts, uh, the big excavations and the hillscape uh, project. Not so much, um, but maybe some other time. Uh, thank you very much for this introduction. Thank you for having me as an invited speaker and to start um, off this uh, seminar series. Um, as Jeff said, I was at Simon Fraser University at some point. I'm currently at the University of Zurich. And actually, I chose this topic uh, of connectivity of the dashed lines talking about hydrologic variation along intermittent streams because it is some work that I started and became really interested in when I was still in Canada. And I thought going back virtually to Canada to give a talk, this would be a good topic for that. Um, what do we mean by connectivity of the dashed lines? Well, the dashed lines here, of course, refers to the temporary streams. These include the intermittent streams that flow maybe seasonally, the ephemeral streams that flow only during uh, rainfall events, and the episodic streams that only flow during really extreme events. Uh, all of them together in uh, temporary streams, and um, a lot of them are shown on the map as dashed lines. So that's the dashed lines in the title. And why are these temporary streams so interesting? And that's because they are among the most hydrologically variable headwater streams. Uh, we can see very large changes in the amount of flow of them going dry and then suddenly flowing again. Um, they are also very common. Um, a lot of the headwater streams are temporary. There is uh, 
a number floating around in the literature that at least half of the streams are globally are temporary. This is partly based on a study in uh, 2008 by Levick et al, uh, who determined that for the US, uh, excluding Alaska, 60% uh, of the, almost 60%, 59% of the streams are temporary. But if we look at what they did, and we see um, they used a survey based on uh, topographic maps, and they did not include any streams that were shorter than 1.6 kilometers. So it excluded all the headwater temporary streams that I'll uh, be talking about now. So maybe that 60% number we can argue about on how uh, representative that, that is. So that's about the dashed lines. Then the part on connectivity. What do I mean with connectivity? I mean with connectivity, the linking of separate regions uh, of a catchment via water flow. And to me, there are three different types of connectivity. Uh, one is one that I uh, am very interested in, and uh, particularly as a hill slope hydrology hydrologists think is very important is this lateral connectivity. How do hill slopes connect to the stream? And when do they connect to the stream? Uh, the second one is this longitudinal connectivity. This is the lateral expansion of the flowing stream network. And that's the topic of today. And in addition, there's the uh, third one, this vertical connectivity uh, in the stream, for example, between the stream and the hyperreic zone. When we talk about connectivity of these dashed lines, of the temporary streams, we can think of three different patterns. Uh, one pattern is this bottom-up pattern, uh, where first the bottom parts of the stream network, they are flowing, and with more and more rain, we see that the stream network, uh, as shown here on the left, becomes more connected and more of these streams start flowing. This is easy to think about if you think about um, for example, uh, groundwater levels going up, and then we find that more and more upward expansion of the flowing stream network. The alternative, what could happen is a top-down pattern, uh, where the streams actually in the upper parts of the catchment start flowing first, and then slowly connect to the perennial streams. This can happen, uh, for example, if the soils are much shallower near the top of the catchment, or if actually we have a, a situation where uh, the top of the catchment is a lot wetter than the bottom due to, for example, a lot of orographic driven precipitation. And of course, the third pattern is this disjointed or mixed pattern uh, where we see both an expansion upward and an expansion downward. And we end up with these um, large areas where the stream is disconnected. So we have upstream areas where the water is flowing and then disconnected sections in between. And the question is, what do these disconnection sections mean then for water downstream? Um, talking about connectivity, if we have these disconnected sections here, for example, in our catchment, we have hill slopes that are connected to the stream. We have a perennial stream. And here we have a flowing stream, but there is these disconnected parts in between. Maybe then that really determines how much we see of this hill slope signal expressed further downstream. So looking at the stream network in these disconnected sections and when they connect um, may be quite important and interesting. But there are some issues uh, when we want to uh, look at intermittent streams. First of all, I said it's the connectivity of the dashed lines and these intermittent streams or uh, temporary streams are often shown on the map as dashed lines. Uh, but sometimes they are not. And for example, here's an, uh, a map of the 13 hectare Studibach catchment in Switzerland. And if we look at the official map, we find that there is uh, almost 0.7 kilometers of stream there. Uh, we don't see any dashed lines there, uh, so zero of them are intermittent. However, uh, when we go out, um, several people have done this, uh, and map every single depression that could be uh, carrying water that looks like a stream geomorphologically, uh, we find um, almost 3.8 kilometers of intimate, uh, of streams. Uh, so way more streams, as you can see on the map, than is shown on the official map. 
And if we look at what per, uh, fraction of them were not flowing during one of the very dry summers that we had, um, that's a very large part of that. Uh, so even the flowing part is still more during a drought than what's shown on the map. But we see that a lot of these little streams here in the catchment, they may be flowing during certain parts, uh, but certainly not the whole year round. Um, the other issue is that for many of these streams, we do not have any data. Uh, as hydrologists, we tend to look at uh, gauging station data, and there is very little data. Uh, this was to me, as a little anecdote, very clear uh, when as part of uh, a European cost action on the science and management of intermittent rivers and ephemeral streams, we wanted to create a sort of picture book or a catalog of intermittent rivers and ephemeral streams and, and put in some different stream flow statistics uh, to show the diversity of these uh, streams. Now, currently, uh, here in, in Switzerland, um, we know from going out that some of these streams, for example, are dry in winter uh, when due to the snow falling on the catchments and uh, that being a relatively, in that sense, dry period, and they go dry. Uh, but I could barely find any gauging station data for such streams, and even finding any streams and gauging station data for intermittent streams in Switzerland was very difficult. And for many other countries, it was the same. Um, a good example is France. Um, here is um, the France gauging station network, uh, the national network. Uh, they have more than 4,000 gauging stations. And uh, what's shown here on, on the graph is the number of gauging stations uh, as a function of the contributing area or the catchment area. And what you see is that the majority of the gauging stations are located in quite large uh, catchments or have a quite large catchment area. What we also see is that here in the blue shaded area is the, um, is the gauging stations that are intermittent. So the ones that are actually going dry occasionally. And that's only 10% of all the gauging stations are located on intermittent streams. Now that percentage is highest for the smallest uh, catchments, uh, the ones that are smaller than, um, than 10 square kilometers but only 5% of all the gauging stations are located uh, in these types of streams. The other thing that you can see here is not a blue line is that for some of these gauging stations, there are zeros in the data as in zero flows, but that may either indicate a moment where there was no data or it's a little bit um, maybe a, a data issue. So even if a gauging station says zero flow, you need to be very careful to check that uh, that gating station is really intermittent. Now in France, for comparison uh, with the national gating station data, they have a fantastic network. It's called the on the network. Uh, here, people go out um, five times per year during the summer. And for the headwater streams, um, they determine what the flow state is. Is it dry? Is it flowing? Or are there pools? Uh, and because these are headwater observations, um, we see that the, the locations uh, of these sites, uh, they're on streams with much smaller catchment areas. But what we also see is that a much larger fraction of them has observations where the stream actually went dry. Almost half of the, the sites in the on the network, they went dry. So from the gauging station data alone, we would say these intermittent streams are not so common. But actually, if we look at the observations um, from this on the network, we see that almost half of them go dry. And it's not just a matter of flow or no flow. As I said, in the on the network, they also look at pools of water, which are quite important. For example, if you think about fish survival. And what we see is that some sites, of course, are 100% of the time flowing. Uh, but we see quite a lot of sites uh, where, where maybe 10 to 20% of the time it's either isolated pools or the streams are dry. Um, so yes, gauging station data we have little, but actually when we have observations, we see that quite a large portion of them have um, at least some time, some parts of the year, no uh, flowing water. 
So if we have no gauging station data and these headwater intermittent streams are actually quite difficult to gauge because uh, gauging stations are expensive and we may have certain uh, large masses of um, debris and sediment moving when they are actually flowing. We may need to look at alternative approaches to get data on these headwater intermittent streams. Um, I'll in today talk about three different ways uh, of getting some data for them. One is mapping, so going out and walk around and map what's happening in these streams. Uh, the second is the home uh, sensors uh, that determine when these streams are flowing and not flowing. And the third method is citizen science that Jeff already uh, briefly alluded to as a, a crowdsourcing um, project. Uh, the results that I'll show come from three different locations. Uh, the first one is Long Joe Creek in the Okanagan in British Columbia, as I said, uh, one of the um, things that I really became interested in while I was in British Columbia were these intermittent streams. So I'll show this first study there. Uh, the second one is in the Alptal, which is very much our um, hydrological pit playground at the moment, uh, much wetter, uh, almost 2,000 uh, millimeters per year. And then a nearby site, it's uh, the Repish catchment, uh, a tributary of the Repish um, at a lower elevation close to Zurich. And then I also show some data sort of across the world based on this crowdsourcing uh, from the crowd water project. So the first one based on, on mapping and also stream flow measurements, this was done uh, in British Columbia, as I said, in the Okanagan, uh, which is very dry, as you can see from the pictures, uh, very little precipitation, uh, little vegetation, largely along the stream on north facing slopes. Um, and this is work done by Emily Huckster, who went up this stream uh, many, many times and measured stream flow and the presence of water uh, throughout a summer uh, melt period and dry down period. And if we look at that, uh, this is the catchment, uh, the elevation. Uh, it is actually a quite simple stream network, one stream. Uh, she had three gauging stations on this stream indicated by these stars. And then in, in gray uh, circles are the locations where she each time measured the stream flow using dilution gauging. And what is important is that we have a bit of a difference in geology and granites at the top then some schists, and then later some more granites uh, at the bottom of the catchment. And in addition, there are some faults running through the catchment. If we look at um, along this stream going from the bottom of the catchment all the way up here, uh, with the stars indicating these locations of the gauging stations, except for the bottom of the catchment, at least in the top sort of the uh, drainage area or the catchment area increases as you uh, go further downstream in a sort of almost linear uh, relation. And then later on, the, uh, the drainage area doesn't change so much, but that's from about uh, three quarters of a kilometer. Um, it says meters, but it should be kilometers uh, up. So what did uh, Emily find? So here is one um, stream flow gauging day. It's on June 3rd, uh, just not so long after snow melt, uh, distance from Longjoe. And I realize all of them say meters, but it should be kilometers. Um, and um, and um, here is the bottom of the catchment and the top of the catchment. Uh, and what we see in these circles is the stream flow that she measured. Uh, the open circles are the adjusted stream flows, taking into account the fact that there is a bit of uh, daily fire, uh, variation um, there. And what we see is that in the upper part of the catchment, uh, the amount of stream flow that she measured increases as you go downstream. So it's a gaining stream, as is indicated here with the blue uh, bars, uh, gaining conditions. And then very much soon after we get this change in geology, out of the schists and into the granites, the stream flow doesn't change anymore. This water is almost just moving through the stream uh, and without any gains uh, on a net uh, basis. We see some gains and some local losses. Uh, and she did that on many different days. So here on the right corner, 
um, upper corner, we see it for uh, two weeks later on June 8. The stream flow is lower, but the pattern is still the same, increasing conditions, and then pretty much flat uh, stream flow or almost um, gaining very little uh, in the lower part of the catchment. Uh, then about a month later, we get into July and late July. Uh, there's very little stream flow uh, left there. And we see still the same. Uh, this gaining in the upper part of the catchment as you go down, stream flow increases. At the very bottom of the catchment, the stream flow doesn't really change anymore. Uh, but in between, we find that there is a section with quite losing conditions uh, where the stream flow uh, is decreasing as you go down. And the same is here uh, for late July uh, with uh, just decreasing stream flow. Uh, but also here in the upper part, then you find a section that may be uh, losing. Important message here is that where you would have put a, the stream flow gauge really affects any interpretation you do on terms of whether the stream is intermittent, uh, what the stream flow is um, of the catchment, and how long the stream would be intermittent. Uh, we see that a little bit better in this graph here, where we have for three different uh, dates, July, August, and September, uh, going from the bottom of the uh, catchment all the way up to uh, where the stream starts, um, what happens there? So in July, still everywhere there was flowing water. Uh, when we go to August, we find that there is flowing water at the bottom. Uh, there are sections where there is no longer flowing water in the middle part, um, as well as in the upper part. And on in September, this is even more clear. And um, there are, in fact, 14 times where the stream goes uh, from flowing to dry and then back to flowing a couple of uh, meters or hundreds of meters further down. I indicated here with the lines where the different uh, geological um, transitions are, and it's not that clear that it's uh, really either the presence of water or the stream growing down has to do with the accumulated area as you go downstream, uh, nor super clear that it has to do with the um, geology, although there seems to be a little bit of a pattern. Uh, if we compare it, for example, with this gaining in blue and uh, and the losing parts of one of these days where we measured the stream flow at every location, you do see that those locations where the stream uh, was decreasing, where we had losing conditions, these are the ones that tend to go dry, and the ones where there was gaining stream flow, these are the ones that tend to uh, continue to flow. Uh, looking at maps, sometimes that's easier. Here are all these different stream flow locations and whether they was flowing water or not. And we see, again, the same pattern with lots of different um, changes between flowing and non-flowing conditions. And so if we would have put it at the outlet, we would have said the stream would have gone dry. But maybe if we would have gone and put a gauging station a little bit further up, we would have said that this is not an intermittent stream. Um, as I indicated already, um, geology and um, maybe a little bit of an influence, uh, but definitely we could have detected where the stream may have gone dry based on this gaining and losing during uh, the early part of the season. Um, and uh, if we look at other things uh, such as slope or uh, the size of the bed material, uh, it's not so clear which si uh, locations keep flowing as is shown on the right or they stop flowing. What is clear is that all the locations where the bed material is very coarse, they uh, are the locations where the stream start uh, stop flowing on the surface because most likely the water is just moving through the stream bed uh, during the summer. On the other hand, for the fine material, it could be either way. Sometimes it may be flowing, sometimes it uh, may have stopped flowing. So. Let's go to another location. And uh, now here is the upper part of the study book. This is in Switzerland, uh, in the Alptal, uh, a very wet uh, climate, uh, wet area, uh, poorly drained soils. Um, and so very different from the Okanagan, almost as opposite as possible. Uh, here I show a tweet 
from Massimiliano Sapa just because uh, it is so nice. Uh, and it shows a movie of the stream flow in, uh, in the neighboring Erlenbach catchment. And you can see that within a few hours, um, actually just less than six hours, it goes from almost no water in the stream to really um, massive uh, stream flow peaks. Um, and so this is a very rapidly responding uh, system. Uh, but in this rapidly responding system where we have a lot of precipitation and we have poorly drained soils, we also have some streams that actually dry out. Uh, so here are some temporary streams uh, in this catchment. And um, based on some mapping uh, done by Oskar Schoberg and, and Rick Assendorft, uh, here's the full stream network. It's already this map that I showed you uh, earlier. We see during a base flow period, uh, not extremely wet, not ex um, uh, not extremely dry, uh, but uh, fall dry period, uh, where we have in blue where the stream is flowing and sort of the reddish colors um, where the stream is dry and the orange and yellows in between where there is a bit of water, but you wouldn't call it flowing. Uh, a couple of weeks earlier during uh, a rainfall event, a uh, low intensity rainfall event, what we see is that much more of the stream network, we have flowing conditions, uh, but there are some parts in between where the stream is dry. These tend to be these very steep areas, as you can see maybe from the contour lines. Um, did some topographic analysis for these different locations. Uh, what are the locations where we have flowing water here on the right in dark blue and standing water in orange on the left? Uh, we see that where we go further down the catchment uh, with bigger accumulated area, we get more and more likelihood that the streams are flowing. Uh, but what doesn't fit that pattern is these dry areas uh, that are sometimes having quite a large contributing area. And you can see that particularly well for the October area. And I'll get back to that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but in this system, you cannot really um, map everything all the time very quickly. Uh, so um, Rick Ossendorf worked on a sensor system uh, that allows us to uh, get data on the presence uh, of standing uh, of water and no water and flow and no flow. Uh, the system uh, is based on electrical resistance sensors, temperature sensors, a float sensor, and a float switch sensor, which are all connected to uh, an Arduino microcontroller. And he installed these at many locations in this catchment uh, to, to determine the presence of uh, flowing water and non-flowing water. And here's an example data series from that, uh, with the resistance being high when the streams are dry, uh, and same for the, the switch and, of course, the flow sensor. At some point, it gets overtopped, but it tells us when there is flowing data, uh, flowing water. And so this is what the interpreted time series then is, when there is water and no water, and when there is flowing water and there is uh, not flowing, uh, no flow. You see that sometimes we do have water, but no flow, uh, so that's more standing water. And if you go up the stream here from the outlet to an upstream area, and this is a, a different branch, uh, you can determine over time. So here's for a one month period what the, the stream is. Uh, we see at the bottom lots of flowing water all the time. Somewhere in the middle, we have a, an area where the stream dries up, as you saw in that map before. And then um, some standing water. Uh, we see sort of downstream contraction as the stream uh, after we go into a period with little rain uh, and we see an upstream expansion uh, as it starts to rain again. Uh, you see that much clearer here on, a, on an animated map, I have to say, here in orange now is standing water rather than green. You see the stream sort of expand in both a upstream direction as well as a downstream direction. And then here in the middle, the stream only starts flowing quite late into the rainfall event, and it also stops uh, starts drying quite quickly. So you get really cool data out of this sensor network uh, on, on what's happening in the stream. 
And um, because you get this for events, you can get it really over the real time period, uh, even for uh, locations that are maybe only flowing occasionally. And what's shown here is for each location as a pie chart is uh, in blue, the, the flowing water, in green, the standing water, and in red, where we have a dry stream bed. And what we see is that there is a region in the middle, similar to that map stream network, where the stream is very often dry. And it turns out that that's a location where we have two different types of schists, um, as, um, two different types of fleece, sorry, which is a sort of um, a sedimentary uh, bedrock, uh, different layers. Uh, and they are, uh, it's the uh, fault zone there, which is causing the streams um, to be much coarser in material. Uh, they're very steep there. And we see that that's uh, where we have lots of uh, dry stream beds. And as we go up the stream network, we see more and more sort of reds and greens uh, where we find streams that are not flowing uh, all the time. And in fact, you can see that here uh, calculated based on a weighted permanence number, where a value of one means that the stream was always flowing and a value of zero means that the stream was always dry. And for all the locations outside this sort of fault zone, <clears throat> We see that as soon as the catchment area is larger than a certain uh, amount here, 10,000 square meters, um, that it's always flowing. And below it, sort of the time or the uh, how long it is flowing increases with catchment area. And for this fault zone here, uh, in between, this relation does not hold at all. You can also, based on the uh, soil moisture, um, how wet the catchment is uh, determined when we have a state change, when does it go into flowing water? And here you see sort of similar for a catchment area, as soon as the catchment is quite big, uh, we need much uh, less um, moisture in the soil. So they are flowing even uh, when um, the catchment is not so wet. And for the smallest uh, catchment area, so those locations quite far upstream, we have quite high um, moisture storage in a way uh, before they start flowing. And again, in the red are those locations inside this fault zone. They do not plot and uh, that relation does not hold. So we've looked at uh, some mapping results, uh, looking at high variability within one catchment and one stream network. We've looked at these sensors, which also shows very high variability uh, within a stream network. But you may also want to get not just one stream very well detailed instrumented, but what about getting a good overview of all the intermittent streams, for example, in Switzerland or in Canada or a particular region? Uh, as a researcher, you cannot do that yourself. Uh, and so maybe it's an idea to involve the crowd, involve other people in doing that. Uh, there are several initiatives to do that. Um, we're part of the we initiated the Crowdwater project and have this app uh, of which temporary streams are one category that everyone can contribute their observations. There are other ones such as Stream Tracker as well. So within the Crowdwater project, we look for temporary streams. And uh, because it's quite hard sometimes to say, is the stream dry or is it flowing? Because sometimes it's just really just dripping water. What does that mean? Is that flow or no flow? Uh, we have six classes that go from the dry stream bed all the way to flowing water. And of course, the difference between these categories is not always so easy. But by having multiple categories, the idea is that if you're one category off, then it's not so bad. You're not making such a big mistake than when you had only two categories. So it's not just black and white, but we have more shades of gray in a way in between the dry stream bed and the flowing water. Um, do people contribute? Yes, people do contribute. At the moment, uh, we have uh, more than 6,000 observations of these um, temporary streams. Uh, here is a map of Europe. Um, we have uh, more than 1,600 locations where people have observed uh, temporary streams. And for 109 of them, we have more than 10 repeated observations. So we can look at time series. Um, 
who are the people that contribute at the moment. Uh, we have about 317 participants that have reported data on uh, temporary streams, and 53 of them have done that quite often, more than 10 times. Uh, and if you want to have a look at this data, of course, go to crowdwater.ch, uh, and also all of this data is freely available. Uh, looking at the map, you find that the, where these spots are, uh, and anyone can start their own observation location or can go to a location where someone else has already observed temporary stream dynamics and add their own observation for that location. Um, and some places we get very detailed data. Here's from Mallorca, uh, a more urban area, but we see here along the stream network, lots of observations that gives a really detailed spatial information. Um, here, uh, is one from Canada. Um, this is observations uh, by Paul Whitfield, who is also one of the people who made me interested in temporary streams when I was still in BC. Um, and uh, with each observation, there is a photo. So that's why you could see in these photos the snow melting, the stream starting to flow, and then um, soon after it will dry out. And so we get, based on these repeated observations, we get data on what these streams are doing. Here's an example from Portugal, where um, I made a mistake here. I quickly, at the end, changed the labeling uh, to have better figures, but now I made it upside down, so I'm very sorry. Uh, here at the top is flowing water, and here at the bottom is the dry stream bed. Um, and you can see the dry stream um in the summer and only the water coming back uh, in fall the same is happening here so sorry don't look at any of these labels on the left side uh, in switzerland where we have water flowing we go this last spring was pretty dry the stream starts to dry out uh, we get some rain the streams start to flow again and we go back to sort of this more uh, intermittent behavior so you can get quite good data actually out of these uh, citizen science observations. And you may wonder how good is that data? Well, with an old classification scheme, we try to assess that by having students rate and determine uh, the state of, uh, of a number of streams. So that's shown here on the x-axis, we have each study site. Uh, and so, um, and then we looked at how many times do the students agree on their observations. So, for example, here for the dry stream bed, uh, these two locations here where it is dry, the students 100% of them agreed. Uh, where the colors become a bit more mixed, we see that the students no longer start to agree. And they, uh, in particular, do not agree on whether we have connected pools or standing water, which is why we changed uh, the categories later. And also for flowing water, they are getting more uh, into an agreement as well as for the wet stream bed. So in general, people do agree on these observations, even if they haven't uh, been told exactly what these classes are. And so I've been talking about observations and I've been talking about variations and you may wonder, does this matter? Why is this interesting? I find it interesting, but why does it matter? And so I want to give two examples. One is for ecology and one is maybe for travel times and stream water quality at the end. Uh, for ecology, as a fish, of course, you can think about whether the stream is flowing or not flowing is really important. Uh, whether there are pools for me to survive the drought period is also really important as a fish. But we also can think of these intermittent streams, they're being very um, specific habitats, um, and, and what if we look beyond fish? So here is a study uh, looking at macroinvertebrates. Um, actually, these are amphipods, um, as you can show here, see here. Um, these are very abundant. Um, they're a detri force and an important food source for um, other species. Um, and they're so abundant that basically, at least in Switzerland, their presence also says something about water quality. If they're missing, um, that you may take that as an indication of a water quality issue. They can survive in the wet stream bed for quite a bit of time. We've done a bunch of mapping and seen that they can survive uh, easily a month, uh, but not two months of uh, dry streams. 
And uh, here's already a summary of our results of this mapping is that the percent of observations that the stream bed was uh, not dry, so 100% means that the stream was always flowing or there was standing water uh, or there was at least a, stream, uh, a wet stream bed. We see that then uh, these amphipods are almost uh, all the time present. Of course, those locations where we never observed any uh, flow here in the left corner, we see also that um, a very uh, these amphipods are never present. So there's a clear correlation between the presence of water and the presence of amphipods, which is not so surprising. Um, if we go into the rapish, uh, and Angela Jenny has done here really detailed mapping of the stream network uh, and in color going from dry to flowing here. Um, we see that at the upper reaches, we have lots of reds. So the stream is often not flowing, but we find also in the middle part, some parts where the stream is often flowing or almost always flowing with lots of these blues. Uh, and not necessarily at the bottom, we find that sometimes it's flowing and sometimes it's not flowing. She's also gone out and measured on all of these dates uh, over the two year period, uh, whether these amphipods are present. And so here red means there were no amphipods and the stream was dry. This brownish beige color means there were no amphipods, but the stream wasn't dry. So theoretically, they could definitely have been there. And then in green is uh, there were some amphipods or there were many amphipods. And so we see the same sort of where in the upper parts, we find lots of amphipods, uh, very few amphipods and the stream was often dry. We find some sections where there were always amphipods some parts in between where there were occasionally amphipods, uh, et cetera. So if we look at the stream here, this uh, going up the stream here, uh, and we look at the time series. So here's from the left to the right over almost a two year, a year and a half time period, uh, and the same colors going from the downstream to the upstream direction. We see interesting patterns for these amphipods. We see some locations like here where there's always water and there are always amphipods. So we have a source there uh, of water and it keeps these amphipods alive. We see also places where we see upstream drying during the dry period and these amphipods start to disappear. We find places later uh, where these amphipods start to recolonize in a downstream direction. Um, and we find places where we have upstream recolonization. So these amphipods start flowing up. Uh, and in fact, if we look at these colonizations and extinction events, we see that 2018 was very dry. Um, we find lots of extinctions, uh, lots of downstream passive sort of movement of the amphipods. Uh, but 2019, a more typical year, we find more of these amphipods also moving and migrating upstream. And so here, whether or not amphipods are present, uh, what matters actually is, was this stream dry at any point in the past uh, couple of months? Because if it was dry in the past couple of months, that may mean that these amphipods aren't there yet. Uh, and so we shouldn't take necessarily this as an indicator that water quality is bad. And then the second and, and last question on does it matter has to do with travel times and solute transport. You may think of uh, a location in a catchment shown here with this uh, red square uh, for a water parcel to move out of this location and to make it all the way to uh, the outlet of the catchment, it takes a certain time. It needs to travel through the subsurface to the stream and then it needs to travel through the stream all the way down. Now, of course, if the stream is very contracted and lots of parts of the stream aren't flowing, then the subsurface part is much longer uh, than when the stream uh, network is fully expanded. And so here is just a sort of calculation, uh, theoretically, for different network lengths on how important this could be for travel time distributions and solute transport. And so what we did is for each pixel in the catchment determined for different stream networks what the total travel time is. And the total travel time is the time in the subsurface plus the time in the river to make it to the outlet. And the travel time in this case is basically just the length divided by a velocity that we, we chose. Um, 
but the pattern is not really dependent on what velocity we choose. Uh, as long as we take a much higher velocity, of course, in the stream than in the subsurface. And so here for this location here, this square uh, is location E here. We can see that if we have very dry conditions and the stream is very, uh, so the flowing stream network is very short and small, um, you need to travel very far below the stream uh, and through the soil before you reach the flowing stream network. Whereas here on the right side, if the stream is fully expanded and it's very wet, and the travel distance is much shorter. And so if we do that for different um, stream networks from the complete network where all the streams that we mapped are flowing, uh, a mapped network when uh, it was wetting up, a dry one, and an extremely dry period, uh, what we see and we choose then some, some velocities where there in this case is a factor um, of a thousand difference between the velocity in the stream and through the subsurface, you can come up with travel times rather than travel distances. Sometimes that's easier to interpret. And for the complete network, we see that we have lots of locations uh, where the travel distance and the travel time is very short. So your many places are very close to the stream. Uh, but on the other hand, for the extremely dry conditions, it's a much flatter curve here. We find that many locations are close to the stream. Uh, quite a lot of locations are quite far away from the stream. And lots of locations are also really far away from the stream. So you get a much more uniform distribution uh, rather than uh, a, a very most of the locations being close to the stream for the complete network. And that, of course, how fast the water can travel or make it to the outlet has lots of implications, for example, for solute transport or when we start thinking about uh, the age of the water in the stream. You can also map this back uh, to the catchment and say, OK, uh, which part are most likely to contribute on a time scale of an event? Uh, and in that case, these travel times, for example, with these chosen velocities are very a small part of the catchment can contribute during dry events, uh, dry conditions with a very small network compared to a fully extended network, simply because this distance from these points here to make it to the stream is so much larger than here, uh, a point to make it to the stream and then make it to the outlet. Uh, with that, um, I think I've shown you a few things on 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 intermittent streams and leave the question on how much this matters for uh, the perennial streams for you to answer. Uh, but I'll show you a video in a second. Uh, there are a few take home messages. Uh, one of the take home messages is that there are very few stream flow gauges on intermittent streams, which makes it really difficult to look at how important and how common uh, these streams are. In addition, we need to map them. Um, and um, we then if we do that, we find that there are many more of them than we thought there were. Um, and we also find that the occurrence of flow is highly variable in space and dynamic. And of course, also affects the interpretation from our gauging station data, because if the gauging station data would have just moved slightly to a different location, sometimes that may mean that the stream may have been dry or not dry. Um, these pools uh, are quite important if we think about habitats, uh, but also for the mapping, uh, I would suggest to always use uh, multiple categories to have something in between flow and no flow. Uh, we've seen that many locations, uh, or at least in those two study sites uh, in Canada and in Switzerland, but also this other one where we looked at amphipods in the rapids, we find locations um, <coughs> We find locations where the stream goes dry. Uh, geology here is important. Topography is important as well. And it's not always a clear pattern of the stream networks expanding in an upslope direction. Um, then the last two things that I try to show you is that this flowing stream length uh, or network, of course, has big influence on the travel time distribution and the travel distances. And these past drying effect, uh, effects um, may affect stream ecology and the, the presence of certain macroinvertebrates. And above all, um, this lack of data is an issue. And I think uh, we need multiple new approaches uh, in order to 
um, study these uh, temporary streams. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. And I leave here a, a, a time-lapse camera video of one of the intermittent streams in the Optal during a rainfall event going from completely dry uh, to quite high flows um, during a rainfall event for you to enjoy, to see how dynamic these streams are and probably to think about what that means for water further downstream. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ilya. And there's clapping happening all around the uh, the internet right now. Thank you very much. And you're you're getting some compliments in the in the chat box. So we'll open it up now for some questions. Uh, I think the easiest way uh, we agreed was via the the chat, just because we're doing this as a WebEx event, and I can moderate uh, moderate that. So any questions, please. Uh, send them via the chat and maybe I could ask just a very quick one to get things going. <clears throat> um, I'm wondering, Ilya, you know, you, uh, you've spent a lot of time thinking about connectivity in the subsurface. Now you're looking at connectivity of the, the surface water in these inter intermittent channels. And I'm just wondering what connections you see between the two. Uh, you've had great success with uh, percolation theory, for instance, getting at the filling and spilling elements of the buried uh, ephemeral channels, as it were. I'm just wondering briefly, as I then look for questions, if you could comment on some of the, maybe the takeaways as it might relate to the, the hill slopes, because in, in some ways the hill slopes and the streams are one. Yeah, I, I fully agree that they are uh, very similar. And I think in terms of patterns, when we start thinking about upstream expansion, downstream expansion, or this disjointed uh, pattern, the same happens in the subsurface and the way that hill slopes uh, or different parts of the hill slope connect to each other and hill slopes ultimately connect to the stream. Um, I would like to make here also a plug for a very old paper from the 60s by Bunting, who talks about percolines and he talks about based on excavations of soil and says the stream network expands into the soil network uh, where we find uh, in the subsurface and on these hill slopes certain um, parts where the water is much more flowing and um, maybe this whole stream network in a way indeed expands into the hill slopes in a similar type of network uh, certainly yeah. the patterns and sort of the thresholds um, are, are very similar. Good, yeah, and I mean, that goes back even further to William Morris Davis in 1899, saying the hill slopes and the streams are one. But, so yeah. yeah, that's that's great. Okay, I see questions coming in, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to uh, ask them for the audience. Uh, uh, Kabir is wondering if you can comment on the role of intermittent streams during floods and droughts. Oh. Um, during floods, I don't know, but um, certainly I would say based on our observations in in the Optal, in the Studiebach catchments, the streams um, ex start to flow very rapidly. And I definitely think that one of the reasons why the perennial streams respond so rapidly is partly because the expansion of the network allows parts in the upper parts of the catchment to be completely connected. Uh, what we are looking at is to see where we have, um, I'll go back to sharing my PowerPoint, is where we, um, well, here's actually fine. Where we have these parts of the catchment that, that where the stream bed remains disconnected and and the stream that disconnect the stream network and where the stream bed remains dry for quite a long time. What happens when the streams, these streams suddenly start flowing uh, because of all of the water that comes from the upper parts and this become connected? Um, certainly, I do think that that drives or it's uh, in addition to all the other inputs um, explaining why suddenly these streams um, are responding so quickly because we do get that connection. But at the moment, yeah. I do not have uh, the 
data completely to say that we see that in the stream flow response at the outlet when that connection happens. Uh, it is one of the things that we're looking into. As what, for what, drought, oh, maybe, maybe just before you go to drought, on, on um, a related question, Pedro's asking, are you measuring groundwater levels on the stream gauges or? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, we've, uh, we have a lot of groundwater uh, level measurements in this catchment. Uh, we installed uh, quite a few um, in, in the Canadian example as well to uh, have multi uh, level posometers in the stream bed also to see where we had uh, gaining and losing conditions. And there, of course, based on the groundwater levels, you can see that a little bit. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good, good. And then uh, maybe in relation to drought, yeah, I could ask a couple of questions that are related. Uh, one uh, from Scott is asking about wetlands and peatlands and how they might factor into uh, classification or identification of streams. Um, yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, some parts here of the, the study bar catchment, we do have sort of uh, wetland areas, uh, as I said, the soils are very poorly drained. It's very wet conditions. So uh, we do have um, very wet soils uh, for a large part of the time. Uh, these network dynamics, they have been studied. For example, uh, earlier I had a reference to a Goulsbra paper. Um, people have looked at stream network uh, connection and expansion and when they turn on into peatlands as well. Uh, and see yeah. similar dynamics. And there, of course, um, they have also related it to the groundwater levels. Yeah, and, and Magali is asking, um, do you see any patterns in terms of vegetation composition for these streams that are uh, intermittent? Or no, are there we don't some, see that. Um, nothing, nothing like that, yeah. The only thing that we see in terms of, for example, this stream here is where we find this fault zone where we have much more forest, drier soils, uh, very yeah. uh -huh. coarse material. Um, and that makes it very hard, at least in this landscape, to map these streams if it was very much related to vegetation and clear right. vegetation corridors, um, it would make life easy. Yeah. And Mohammed's asking, can we use tracers? Oops, it just went away with another one that came in. Uh, can we use tracers um, instead of the assumption of X equals VT? I guess thinking about yes. your travel times, what's Definitely. the, what are some follow on studies perhaps that would use uh, tracers in that context? Yeah, the real thing of course would be to use tracers and to get it out of the data from the tracers. Um, yeah. One of the things that in in the in the example of the travel times and the travel distances, what we did not do on purpose is to change the velocities. Uh, in reality, of course, the velocities will depend very much on um, on the wetness of the catchment. Um, and actually, it would make the differences between what we see in terms of the distribution even bigger. Uh, here, we did not do that in order to show that even if everything else is the same, the fact whether what the size of the flowing stream network or the density of the flowing stream network is has a huge effect on the distribution. In reality, and um, a lot of things will change at the same time, which would make the interpretation of the tracers a little bit more complicated. But of course, the real way of doing it is, is to actually do this based on tracer data. Yeah. Good. Here's one from Robbie. Um, in the catchments that had losing conditions in portions where faults were present, where does the water in the gaining sections downstream of the fault come from? Is it mainly stored groundwater inputs below the fault zone or event water? Um, I would think that for a large part in those locations, the, the water infiltrates into the stream bed. Um, in the Okanagan site, I think lots of it then goes into bedrock recharge that comes uh, out much later in the valley. Um, but part of it will just flow through the stream bed and, and discharge uh, somewhere else further downstream. Uh, yeah. All of this was not 
if in the Okanagan, we do have few events over the summer. Uh, so um, most of that is not event water. Mm -hmm. It's about water that comes back in. Good. I see there's another question from Mohammed. Mohammed, we'll get to you in the next hour when we reconvene the class. So thank you for that. And thank you everybody for the questions and especially Ilya for such a, a stimulating talk. We're at the top of the hour and we should probably wrap up. But uh, Ilya, on behalf of uh, the Global Institute uh, for Water Security here and our Global Water Futures Project, uh, we'd really like to thank you for uh, participating. This goes to our students and our Masters of Water Security program, uh, both here at the university and at Beijing Normal University. So uh, beyond the live participants, there's going to be a multitude of uh, those that are watching in tape delayed format. So thanks so much again yeah. for really a, a terrific talk. And we're looking forward to the classroom discussion with you uh, in the next few minutes. So we'll, we'll transition from one to the other. So yeah, you're, you're... thank you all for listening and thanks for inviting me, John. Great, thank you. And there's many, uh, many uh, praises of your talk coming in on the chat and you can uh, look at that as we, uh, we sign off here. So again, thanks everybody for attending. We're looking forward to seeing you all again next week for Anna Barros. And this was uh, really a terrific kickoff, Ilya. Thanks again. Thank you all. Okay, bye now. <laughs>